On October 29th, 2002, Microsoft released Windows XP Media Center Edition to, uh, I guess, through manufacturers. There were a lot of Windows XP variations, but Media Center Edition was one of the unlucky ones that never received a full retail release. Instead, Microsoft issued OEMs the operating system to include with pre-built machines. There were some unfortunate reasons for this we'll get into, but this means the period correct way to experience it is to find one of these computers. Since October 29th, 2022 marks the 20 year anniversary of it, as a way of celebrating this, we will be looking at one of the kings of XP Media Center, the Gateway FMC 901X. Windows XP Media Center Edition is a strange thing to say the least. On the surface, its main selling point is just a front-end GUI to use on the couch. But it has more than that going on when you start digging deeper, and it was a product that made sense at the time. The concept of a multimedia PC developed as the CD-ROM was released, and using your computer for photos, music, and videos started to become possible. The original MPC standard was set in 1991, with requirements that a computer had to meet to be considered multimedia capable, and Microsoft was one of the leading partners in setting this standard. MPC stopped being updated around the release of DVDs, meaning it never got to the point of requiring MPEG-2 decoding, a feature to playback DVDs that can be achieved either with a dedicated MPEG-2 card or a graphics card with DVD features built in. A similar project by Microsoft was Web TV, an internet-based interactive TV device. These were very underpowered devices, not capable of running traditional software or playing back most media. They later included TV tuners, provided channel guides, and a small number could record TV for playback. But around the year 2000, there was a boom in new forms of media consumption and creation. MP3 players were hitting the market, digital camcorders were becoming the norm for home movies, and CDs and DVDs were at their height for media distribution. This was the perfect environment for PCs to become a home entertainment centerpiece. It only felt like a natural step for there to be an all-encompassing software to allow your computer to be your central media system. Windows XP Media Center Edition sought to be all this and more in one package. But Media Center wasn't just a program or add-on that you would install on your computer. It was a different version of the Windows XP operating system that had different requirements. Before we take a closer look at the software though, we need to get acquainted with the hardware. As Microsoft didn't directly market XP Media Center Edition for retail, the initial launch was done with HP releasing the first computers for it. One of the characteristic differences of these was including video inputs. On the 88.3n system from HP, these are included on the back, Type F RF for TV, as well as S Video and Composite. A contemporary review for this computer noted the weaker GPU it came with, and the difficulty in upgrading it. This problem was mostly due to drivers, which were provided specifically for Media Center Edition. If you attempted to run unsupported hardware on it, it would show an error and probably fail to work. Since Media Center wasn't intended to be released to consumers, drivers weren't made available for all hardware. The reason for these special drivers was likely for hardware media decoding and copy protection, something that caused more problems later as we'll see. So you couldn't get the OS directly, and only specific hardware was supported. Pre-builts really were the only option that made sense. So let's take a look at the one I have here. This is the Gateway FMC 901X, an $1800 PC in 2004 that shipped with the second version of Windows XP Media Center Edition known as, well, 2004. The different releases of Media Center somewhat track to the service packs for standard XP versions, with updates to the Media Center capabilities as well. This was similar to how Windows 95 has OSR versions for OEMs. It has taken me quite some work to do, but I've managed to get this computer back to its mostly stock configuration, including Media Center 2004. Since you couldn't buy and upgrade Media Center releases, that's the only version this system can officially have. This was the highest end model gateway made at the time, equipped with a 3 GHz Pentium 4 hyperthreaded ATI Radeon 9800 Pro, 512 megabytes of RAM, and a 250 gigabyte hard drive. Then it has a Hapage TV tuner and Sound Blaster Autogy with custom cables routed to the front. This thing is a beast, and these high end parts are stock. It even came with a label for these so the less technically inclined knew what the connectors do. For peripherals, it has a bespoke Media Center remote and a gyration air mouse and wireless keyboard set. The mouse and keyboard are mostly just okay. The remote is what you would really use for Media Center. Perhaps most importantly for this computer though, it came in this completely custom case designed to blend in with your Media Center equipment. 
This was somehow the first Windows Media Center computer to do this seemingly obvious thing. It's also really well made. The metal looking parts are actually thick brushed aluminum plate that was also used on the remote. That's real metal, not paint or a thin decal. It also has front panel navigation controls, extra ports and buttons on the front hidden under a door, a customized DVD writer to blend in, and without a doubt the best feature, a custom VFD driven by Media Center that shows the playback info. Now, when setting this up, at the time, the most likely display to be used with one of these would be a large projection TV, but I don't have one of those, and they mostly seem to be gone now. But I do have a very early LCD TV from 2004, a Sony Qualia 005. Though I am missing the stand and weighing over 100 pounds, it's not easy to find a modern replacement. Being high-end, I'll get to connect it with DVI, but this video was common as well, making it easy to use with most TVs. To first boot the computer, you have to push the power button like normal. After that, you can suspend and wake with the remote, which uses a standby mode that spins down the hard drives. If you're fully utilizing this PC, you would want to do this as well. The computer boots to the standard Windows XP interface, showing Bliss and the start bar, but hey, wait a minute. Didn't Media Center use the Royale theme? It turns out that wasn't released until the 2005 edition. I still want to stick with 2004 in this system, but I can backport that theme here like you can with any XP release. Ah, <sighs> much better. With a remote, you are just a press of the Media Center button away from accessing the main event. Navigating this menu feels a lot like a console port and is best done with a remote, using mostly the D-pad, enter, and back buttons, which are also the main buttons on the front of the computer. From the main screen, you can select many different types of media, TV, music, pictures, videos, and DVDs. Let's start with music, because this goes into a bigger aspect of this system that would have been kind of awesome back in the day. MP3 players were huge at this time, but online music distribution wasn't yet. Well, at least legitimately. So it was common to rip your CDs to take on the go. Right from the CD menu in Media Center, it lets you do this, which will rip to WMA and store it in your music folder. Most CDs don't contain metadata, and CD text isn't supported anyway, so Media Center would get album, artist, and track titles from the internet. This, unsurprisingly, doesn't work at all anymore, but it didn't always work then either. So to add tags to your rips, you would have to go back to the desktop and use Windows Media Player manually. Media Player isn't great for large libraries though, so if you did this enough, you would probably switch to something like Winamp. This was worth the effort though, because you could build up an on-demand music library and play any of it at any time. And there was a visualizer built in to make the experience even better. Also music related, the tuner card in this is capable of playing FM radio, and it buffers the audio allowing you to pause and rewind it live. Despite it clearly being capable of recording though, it can't do that. This was a common feature for cassette decks, but the RIAA was getting kinda touchy around this time, likely leading to that not being allowed here. Next, the section for My Videos may not be what you first think. It is intended literally for your videos, home recordings, as evidenced by the date always being prefixed to the file name. This is why there are video input jacks on the computer, so you can connect a camcorder and record your footage into it. Even for digital camcorders, file formats weren't very standardized at this point, so re-recording the video, while not ideal for quality, could be easier. However, if you were more technically inclined, you could install a codec pack that would likely solve this problem. I used K-Lite on this system to enable playback of 3GP and XVID files, for example, neither of which worked out of the box. This also makes it easier to play videos sourced from, uh, elsewhere. And now for the TV section, which is perhaps the best, most unique, and well-developed part of the Media Center experience. Using the capture and tuner card in the computer with a cable box or antenna, you could watch live television through your computer. Channel guides could be downloaded over the internet to know what shows were coming up. Then, for the cherry on top, you could use the computer as a DVR to schedule recordings to happen automatically. The standby mode could wake the computer, switch to the correct channel, and record the show. There were standalone recorders at the time that allowed this time shifting so you can watch shows when you want, but doing it with a PC was free and gave more control. I actually did this back in the day. It was awesome, and especially handy for watching late night shows at more reasonable times. Since this is just recording live TV, you would end up with commercials as well, but you could fast forward through the recording, so that wasn't as big of a problem. What was a problem was how the recorded files were stored. 
a DVR MS file, which couldn't be used in anything other than Media Center and Player, but there were third party programs that could convert these. Then you could use them however you wanted, like putting them on a portable player to watch on the go. Doing this would also make it easier to build up your own media library of TV show recordings. You don't have these same kind of freedoms with the DVD player though. It is a very good DVD experience. Playback is actually wrapped by Media Center and handled by a third party program, WinDVD here. The motherboard of the computer also has optical out and the system can support 5.1 surround, which was the best audio at the time. But like the radio option, you cannot copy a DVD to the hard drive from Media Center. Copying wasn't the only problem though. There were devices capable of what we now call casting sold as media center extenders that allowed you to access your media center PC from a television over your network. These had limitations with copy protection restrictions, and by limitations I mean they just didn't work. DVDs were huge at the time, and not supporting a large feature in your niche product wasn't the best idea and they weren't supported for long. There was also the photo section. Digital cameras were still kind of a new thing at this time, and people were looking for all sorts of ways to justify their usage. This was more to tick the box that it can show photos than anything else, because who really wants to sit through a slideshow? Even in Microsoft's demo video of Media Center, it just feels awkward. Now one thing Media Center Edition did not cater to was games. There was actually a games menu built in with some unambitious examples included, but these were played through the remote and as enjoyable as you'd expect. One problem with real games is that wireless controllers were not very common and long USB cables were kind of a pain and risky on the ports. But if you figured out your interface devices, it was just the same normal XP computer experience, except slightly worse. Because the drivers are special and have to be media center compatible, it's not as easy to get every game working. On this computer I installed Fear, because again, this thing is a beast and could totally rock that, but the lighting was completely messed up, so I grabbed the latest media center drivers from AMD's site and it broke even launching the game. I managed to find two more earlier versions of the drivers. One made Fear work, but then broke Serious Sam when I tried that. The other worked with both Fear and Serious Sam, but then crashed during FMVs in the Godfather game. I never found a fully working driver compatible with just these three games, and I can imagine this was a nightmare to troubleshoot back in the day. The Windows XP Media Center Edition computers were a really interesting offshoot from the typical PCs of the day. If you were living the multimedia life at the time, this could have been really awesome, but for average computer use, these would have been problematic. Another thing I didn't even get to was that you would likely encounter problems just trying to update it, because it doesn't use the same service packs. If it was a secondary computer that you just use for media, it would be really awesome, but that makes its high cost even harder to justify. My final impressions really are positive overall, it just isn't without fault. A lot of this was fixed with the next major version of Media Center that came with, ugh, Vista. It was significantly overhauled visually for this release and actually worked well with normal hardware. It mostly stopped receiving updates after that though and was silently cancelled as physical media lost popularity. I'm glad I was able to get this example back up and running though, and it was fascinating to experience firsthand. I hope you enjoyed this video taking a look at Windows XP Media Center Edition, and if you did, you may want to subscribe. If you want to help support the channel, I am on Patreon. But for now, that's it, and I will see you next time.